It's a desire we all share, to lead a rich, fulfilling, happy life. But you can't always get what you want. Why are we so fickle? Why is it that, that one day the things that make us happy, the next day bring us misery? This emotional life is a roller coaster, taking us from the heights of ecstasy to the depths of despair and every place between. All emotions have a role in a healthy life. We're not automatons. I'm Dan Gilbert, and in this series, I'm going to introduce you to everyday people who are searching for happiness, as well as to the scientists and clinicians who are trying to help them find it. What I've taken away is the resilience of the human spirit. It is just amazing what we can go through and be okay. At first, I thought I was going crazy. The dreams, the nightmares, but I'm not letting it beat me. What more can I say? I'm a happy camper. <laughs> we'll see how our greatest source of happiness lies in the people around us. The lesson we've learned is that a basic need for human beings is love is companionship. We'll see what happiness is, what causes it, and why we look for it in all the wrong places. I used to think that things would make me happy, more money, success. I'm realizing now that that's not the fact. Happiness comes from within. But next, we'll explore the obstacles to happiness, emotions such as fear, sadness, and anger. Have I lost it to the point where I did feel like I've lost it? Yeah. I went through like six or seven years of real depression. I just was never quite given the right pill. Asking why we have them, why we need them, and how we can all keep them under control. I remember Caitlin screaming, you don't understand how horrible it is to be caught in this brain that doesn't work. And I want you to fix this. Coming up, facing our fears on this emotional life. In the 80s, there was a poll done in one of the newspapers. The most heinous, you know, people in the 20th century, you know. It was like Jack the Ripper was one, I was two, Charles Manson was three. You know, I mean, it was like, wait a second, okay? I yelled at an umpire, okay? I didn't mutilate 40 people or whatever. <laughs> anger feels hot, even talking about anger, my whole rib cage is warm, <laughs> my legs are mobilized, it's the fight. I feel my jaw getting clenched, I wanna punch somebody. <laughs> you know, I, I used to be the kind of guy who, who I, I would scream on the street. I was screaming on street corners. When, when I asked somebody the time and they go, oh, you know, uh, you know I, I would scream, I'd get in fights, you know. I was in a bar, and I was with my girlfriend. Across the way, there were three huge dudes, and they were there chilling and sort of saying things amongst themselves about her. And um, so, you know, that really got to me to the point where I got up off my chair and I walked over to them and then in a sort of methodical sort of way, you know, sort of start picking at them. You're that piece of lard ass, you rich mama's boy. You're being a real Do you understand that? When I want to hurt somebody, I'm not thinking about how could they hurt me. I'm thinking about how angry I am. It just, he just drives you. Mary is a Los Angeles-based writer and filmmaker who knows what it's like to be in the grip of anger. I was born in Barranquilla, Colombia, which is on the northern coast of South America. My family moved here when I was 10 years old. My father was very frustrated. 
He would do things like punch walls and kick doors down and things like that. He was really tense. He was really angry. And by the time that I was like 14, 15, I was really reacting. I was so angry at him that I wanted to, uh, I almost kind of wanted to fight him to see who would win. He eventually sort of progressed, uh, just sort of like a general anger towards people, towards things, towards uh, a world that didn't understand me. Yeah. On okay. the right or on the left? Yeah, or on, on the, the right. right. On, on the, the right. right. Yeah, especially. Okay. When I get into arguments, get into fights, I only see that person or that thing in front of me that I want to attack. And then I'm acutely assessing the situation, but only for one purpose, and that's to win. When animals are threatened, they experience a surge of hormones that make them ready to attack or to retreat. Human animals are no exception. Our fight or flight response is crucial for our survival. Anger can feel exhilarating because what we do is trigger the fight or flight response. We secrete lots of adrenaline to power our large muscles in the event that we have to fight or flee from the predator. We secrete cortisol, which heightens our auditory and visual sensitivities. We stop digesting lunch because who needs to digest lunch if you're about to become lunch? Now that response is very appropriate when we're dealing with life-threatening danger. However, the yellow cab driver that cut you off in traffic comes to supplant the saber-toothed tiger that our ancestors millennia ago were dealing with. And when we look at what happens physiologically, we stay in this heightened state for quite some period of time. And because we're dealing with fight or flight, we're dealing with impulses that are very strong. While ancient structures like the amygdala respond to threats by trying to turn our anger or fear on, it's newer structures, such as the prefrontal cortex, the thinking part of our brain, that try to turn them off. It's the tug of war between these two systems that gives rise to our emotions. At New York University, neuroscientist Joseph Ledoux has studied how the amygdala and the cortex shape our emotional responses. You know more about the amygdala than anybody alive, and you still can't control yours. No. Why? Now, there's an interesting thing, again, that has to do with the wiring of the brain. This is if we could just look at it here. So this is the human brain inside a skull. And the prefrontal cortex is here in the front, right behind your forehead. And that is the, the newest part of the, the brain. This is where we make our decisions. This is where we plan for the future um, and strategize. The lateral prefrontal cortex has no connectivity with the amygdala. The amygdala has super highways to talk to the cortex, but the prefrontal cortex has only back roads and side streets to get to the amygdala. And therefore, it is unable to tell the amygdala cool it. But why are there no connections? We're in the process of evolving as we speak, and those connections have not been put in yet. This thing was built to do fancy things cognitively, not necessarily to control our emotions. The fact that we are not designed to have complete control over our emotions can have some unfortunate consequences. I was in such a deep, dark place that I couldn't even really see myself. Like, I had become this, like, muddled thing of a person. I was so sad. I was so angry. I couldn't get beyond it. I realized I had to, to do something when I hit rock bottom. One of my friends invited me to a party, and I was having a great time, but uh, because I'm a control freak, I decided that I wanted to change the song. I wanted to go over to the iPod and change the song. 
So the guy whose party it was came over to me and he's like, are you doing? And I, boom, I just went off. I'm like, who are you? And he was like, it's my party and I'm gonna play what I want. And I'm like, you're a selfish and just slapped him across the face and his glasses went flying across the room. Um, and so at that moment, it was like everything sort of fell away. You know what I mean? Like there were at least another 20, 30 people in the room and I could see none of them. They just turned into like this blur and all I could see was this guy. He grabbed a chunk of my hair and he hung on to it really tight. So I just started kicking him. I was just like laying on him, like, let go, let go, let go. I kept on saying, let go, let go. I just kept on kicking him, just kicking him and kicking him and kicking him um, until he finally let go. And at that point, I started crying. And uh, it was like everything became real again. And all the people um, were there and they were looking at me with such like shock and awe and I, I felt horrible. That I, that I did it. <laughs> That's what hurts me. And that I shouldn't, you know, that it goes against my values, it goes against who I am, you know? Um, that's, that's, that's what hurts me. Think about what happens after an argument that was really intense. People feel terrible. Oftentimes they feel depressed afterwards. It's not a good long-term solution. Anger, uh, it's not a helpful emotion. It's not always an appropriate emotion. And in the cases in my own life when I've allowed it free range, I've allowed it action, I've always regretted it after. I don't, I can't think of a time when I've seen my own anger as something that was constructive for me or uh, useful in the world. But I've noticed where my anger comes out in subtle or not so subtle ways and how it's, it's wrought a lot of havoc in my personal life. So um, including the, the anger that I've turned toward me. Have I lost it to the point where I did feel like I've lost it? Yeah, it's not easy to feel like you made an ass out of yourself, perhaps, and get through that. But people do, I, I, I think people make mistakes every day of their life. Can we outsmart our own brains? Can we learn to control our emotions? Stanford psychologist James Gross has spent his career studying what scientists call emotion regulation. For me, emotion regulation is really the science of understanding how we can modify our emotions, harness their energy, so that we can direct them in ways that we wish to go. So for me, emotion regulation isn't turning down or turning off all emotions, because emotions, I think, are often incredibly helpful and are what make us who we are. But I think at times, it's great to have a set of tools that we can avail ourselves of so that we can change the course of the emotions that we're having. To test his theory, Gross asked about 100 women to take part in an experiment. Each woman was wired up to a machine so that researchers could measure her heart rate, pulse, and perspiration, all physiological indicators of emotional arousal. First, the women were asked to recall a recent incident that had made them angry, and to think about the incident again and again, to keep turning it over in their minds, to consider and reconsider every detail. Scientists call this rumination. To Mary, this way of thinking came quite naturally. I didn't understand why it was so easy for me to like just 
go into these ranting raves and just become so obsessed on this thing, okay? You, you forgot to call me. Why did you forget to call me? You should have called me. I don't understand. Okay, you were busy, but I, re I, re I reminded you several times. It's, you become fixated on these things, you know, like, and you don't take a moment to breathe. In the next phase of the experiment, the women were again asked to think about the incident that made them angry but this time to try to visualize it as a neutral observer or from the perspective of the other person. This is a technique that scientists call reappraisal. When the subjects ruminated, their cardiovascular system went into overdrive. When they reappraised, their bodies became calmer and their anger diminished. One of the things that people for a very long time have uh, repeated again and again is that Actually, there's an important role for thinking in emotions. And if you can change the way you think, you can change the way you feel. Back in the day, you know, I, I had to go to therapy, and I found that it, it saved me because I was very, you know, kind of self-destructive. I was always acting out. Four years of that, twice a week, made a huge difference. It's a wonderful thing to, to be able to go to somebody who, you, who didn't raise you, who you're not married to, who you don't have a 15-year friendship relationship with, and, and be able to tell them what you secretly are longing for or needing without feeling that you're going to be judged or, um, or that you're going to hurt their feelings if this comes out. So by being able to unload these feelings to this doctor, and I did, I told her everything that was making me feel crummy, uh, and we discussed it. When I walked out of there, you know, maybe between the time I left her office and into my car, I was floating on air. Psychotherapy has been with us for more than a century. Sigmund Freud was the first to suggest that emotional problems may be the symptoms of something much deeper, something more significant, something the mind is hiding from itself, such as a traumatic childhood experience or a forbidden sexual impulse. So he had people lie on his couch and talk about their dreams and their childhood in the hope that they might say something that would reveal the true cause of their emotional distress. This kind of therapy was intense, complex, and went on for a very long time. Uh, yes, eight years I was on a couch, and um, five years I was allowed to sit up and face them. And... In a 1970s interview, comedian Woody Allen poked fun at the process. I don't know. How, how do you know, really? That's what it's always the big question mark for me is, when do you decide, I'm done? Ah, that's a good point. I don't know if you're ever really done. I know that certain characteristics about me are different now than they were when I started analysis. I'm, I started when I was uh, 22, and I'm 35. So I have age. That's something. Uh, that is progress, because yes. it's upward. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, and I can, uh, when I have sexual relations with someone, I can now think of that person. Rather than? Rather than somebody else which is an enormous step forward to me. How many years did that take? Where did that come in, roughly? That just came in last week. Oh. In recent years, Freud's therapy has evolved into a more streamlined form of the treatment, known as psychodynamic therapy. The focus is on helping the patient develop insight into how things they feel today or expectations they have about life and about people come from their past. And that the insight itself helps them to, to change their behavior and their ways of thinking and, and helps with the symptoms they might be experiencing. Psychodynamic therapy is based on the fact that people don't always know why they feel and think and act as they do. But in recent years, some psychologists have suggested that rather than searching for the hidden causes of emotional problems, therapists might just help people develop the skills they need to deal with them. This idea is the basis of a different kind of therapy, one that's helping people learn to control one of the most primitive human emotions, fear. Christina Kelly is a freshman at Harvard. She's a great student and a terrific athlete. But she's deathly afraid to do something that millions of Americans find easy. I am afraid of flying. It's not rational, and I know that. But at the same time, that's definitely just what makes it a phobia. I just can't. I know it's irrational, and I can't do anything about it. It's not that I'm afraid that they're going to go crashing to the ground or that someone's going to, you know, try to take it over or anything. 
but there's not really anything that I can like pinpoint as to why I'm afraid, and so I think that kind of adds to the whole like overarching fear. Is fear of flying really irrational? Do we have nothing to fear but fear itself? I'm I'm scared to death of dogs. I mean, dogs are scary things. They're they're these sort of strange failed human beings who have all these emotions and yet they have these enormous teeth at the same time. I always have that weird sensation when I'm out on a balcony or in a high place that where the bottom is accessible that I'm gonna climb over the railing. That doesn't mean you're going to or you're even contemplating it, but the fact that you're in a situation where it's possible, it completely unnerves me. Does anyone else have that? <laughs> yeah. I think our bodies are beautifully equipped. Our reptilian brains and our animal tendencies are generous and smart and helpful. And you know, if my house is shaking, in the middle of an earthquake, I, I hope my body will kick into high adrenaline, grab my dogs and my turtle and grab everything and leave. There are certain situations that have recurred over evolutionary time over and over again that cause fear. For instance, some nasty animal running towards you very fast and burying its fangs that's the kind of situation that's happened not too often, but often enough, so that individuals who have what we call a fight-flight response have a lot of advantages over those who say, oh, hello, kitty. Uh, it's just not a good thing to be you know, laid back and mellow when there's a lion coming towards you very quickly. So in the clinic, of course, we call this a panic attack. Panic attack is just identical to a fight-flight response, and it's perfectly normal lots of the time, but not usually in a grocery store. Medications haven't worked for Christina Kelly. With emotions, it's often a paradox, you know, that the, the more we don't want an emotional state, the more that we experience it, right? And as soon as we allow the emotion to come, a lot of times it kind of starts to diminish more quickly. But Today, Christina Kelly will attempt to board a plane with Todd Farchione, the therapist who is helping her conquer the phobia that's kept her from traveling to visit friends and family. Just the way it is, whether you feel things or you don't feel things, whether it's bumpy or not bumpy, you can handle that situation. That's the most important. Dr. Farchione uses cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, which is extremely effective for people with specific phobias. About 85% of those who try it show significant improvement. Cognitive behavioral therapy has got a different focus, which is on identifying and correcting dysfunctional thoughts and feelings that make you miserable. So a cognitive behavior therapist is not so interested in why you have those thoughts or feelings. He's interested or she's interested in basically getting you to identify them and challenge them. We say you have a little machine down buried in your emotional brain, and it's spitting out you know, all of these really scary kinds of thoughts. But because you're the one thinking those thoughts, you tend to believe it. So we have a saying in cognitive therapy, don't believe everything you think. Christina's therapy started two days earlier when she met Dr. Farchione at his office. Most people sign up for a dozen or more treatments over a period of weeks. But Christina opted for a marathon session lasting three days. Well, let me just start by asking you how you, uh, how you did last night. Good. Um, I tried to explain it all to my family, so okay. I think that helps me kind of like go over it. So at this point, how are you feeling about taking that flight? I'm very nervous, and it, 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 it switches back and forth between being like, oh, I can do this, and then suddenly I'll feel like this is really overwhelming and like all at once, and I can't believe I'm doing this. Um. With panic, what often happens is that it becomes this cycle, um, that there's a recognition of the physical symptoms, and as a result of that, there's then an increase in the actual physical response, right? An increase in those symptoms, right? So as you're approaching the plane, for instance, if you start having physical feelings, and you say to yourself, like, well, they're not going to go away, or this is going to be really bad, this is, an off this is going to be an awful trip, this type of thing, um, it's likely that that physiological changes are going to increase, right? 
So one of the things that we want to do is we want to see if we can't elicit some of these symptoms um, in part so that you can see that this is just your body doing what your body should do. Early in the session, Dr. Farchione asked Christina to do a series of exercises that bring about some of the physical sensations associated with fear, such as dizziness, shortness of breath, and a racing heart. The idea is that once Christina becomes more familiar with these sensations, she will become less afraid of them. And how similar is that to what you experienced prior to? Uh, uh pretty similar, like pretty similar. six or seven. I okay, think. six or seven. That we're going to go into this, um, this, this flight with no safeties, no, no avoidance, and essentially uh, confront what it is that you're afraid of. And if that means experiencing those sensations in that situation, again, that's not a problem. Then it's a matter of allowing them to come and allowing them to diminish of their own accord. You know, if something's terrorizing, terrorizing you and, 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 and bothering you, like, let's not, let's not run away. Let's go find it, you know? If you had to rate it on a zero to eight point scale, where would you put your anticipatory distress right now? Eight. eight. Okay. So it's pretty, it's pretty high. Dr. Farchione encouraged Christina not to push the frightening thoughts aside, but instead to let them come to mind so that they can be examined or reappraised. So what can we come up with as a good alternative here? It's going to be hard, but it's going to be OK. <laughs> So we're going to, it's going to be hard. I'm going to feel scared and panicky. Yeah, good. Sure. One of the key principles behind CBT is that we can change our feelings by changing the thoughts that produce them. We're not trying to stamp out all bad thoughts. In fact, that might be counterproductive. We're just trying to say, let's look at the alternative. Let's put this in perspective. Let's reappraise this. And oh yeah, you'll continue to have scary thoughts, but you know what? You can live with them. And when they do that, it actually changes brain function. There are changes in the prefrontal cortex, working down into the emotional brain, just by this really working hard on reappraising. Allowing it to unfold is actually gonna be the fastest way for it to, for it to diminish, right? But you're still, <laughs> you're still scared, we still need to do this. Your, your return boarding pass is stapled right on the back. Now comes the decisive moment. Christina will attempt to board a plane. Cognitive behavioral therapy has a cognitive or thinking component, but it also has a behavioral component. We must go out and do the things we're afraid of so that we can learn from experience not to be afraid of them. The important thing is that reappraisal. It has to be paired with what we call exposure where people will begin to put themselves in the feared situation under therapeutic guidance and with the appropriate coping mechanisms where their emotional brain can really begin to learn and become convinced that these terrible things will not happen. What's wrong with the way that you're feeling right now? It sucks. <laughs> what sucks about it? It's not comfortable. What's the most uncomfortable part of it? Is it the heart? The heart rate? It's feeling like I'm gonna cry. <laughs> and have been for the last like three days. That's not fun. Okay. So it's it's feeling it's feeling as though you might cry and, and, and what the what is the implications of that? What if you did cry? I don't want I'm not gonna cry. What if you did? That just makes it worse. It does? Yeah. Take a moment to review the safety information card in your seatback pocket. Passengers seated in rows 9 and 10 are also asked to review exit row seating requirements. What we're trying to end up with is somebody who can totally accept the full range of their emotional experience. Be aware of what their emotions are doing in the way they're making you feel, the way they're making you think, the way they're making you behave, and accept that and sort of be with it 
and distance yourself from it. And in so doing, put the emotion in its place. I like this idea of you moving around a little bit, so if we can break. Uh, like get up or just um, yeah, maybe get up. Maybe see if there's anything in the overheads uh, that you might need. Um, if you want, you can put my coat over the overhead or something along those lines. Okay. okay. Do it quickly. Quick. I, don't, I don't want there to be that hesitation. I want. There it is. No, no, no. Go ahead and put my coat in the overhead for me, please. The one moment that really stuck out for me was the moment at which she was willing to get up. She didn't want to do it, but she did it. You know, I mean, she really, she knew it was the right thing to do, and she committed to it. That was the point at which I felt very uh, good about her ability to overcome this problem. You're getting there. You're getting there. Slowly but surely. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm gonna say actually, um, I don't think it's as slowly as you uh, you might imagine, but you're doing you're doing a fantastic job. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> I might see you again soon. Thank you. See you guys. All right. I like them. It's like the uh, yeah, they were nice, right? It's, uh, I wish we had like some uh, triumphant music. Now now this yeah. is where we pull out the iPod sure, and you put on like. Uh, Maybe like the Rocky theme yeah. or something like yeah. that. <laughs> I flew. It's exciting. Not as bad as I thought it was going to be, but I did it. And that's the first time I've gone in a real plane in two and a half years. And just the fact that, that I did is, is empowering. And, and I'm glad that it was successful. And I, in the middle, I felt better. So it's good. I mean, an air conditioner can drop off a building. You know, mold, uh, this, is, if, this is not irrational. When I'm walking down the street and I think about air conditioners dropping off of, you know, the edges of buildings onto my head, even if somebody says, well, it's only a one in a million chance that's going to happen. I mean, there's eight million people in the city. And so that's actually like a lot of air conditioners. Sometimes when I'm really happy and things are going well, that makes me anxious because I think, oh, God, you know, life is so tenuous and fragile. In an instant, it could all change. I have friends that sit there and the glass is half full. My glass, somebody said to me the other day, is not only half empty, what's in it is filled with poison. So I am always anxious. If anxiety prevented me from doing what I want to do, I wouldn't be sitting here, no. I think it spurns me on. Anxiety isn't something, if you're born with it, that you can hope to eliminate. It's something that you learn to use. And to the degree that you can use it, and it's a useful emotion in that way. It's like having your own little pump of caffeine uh, running through your veins, and you you turn it on. You order up, a, you know, a triple anxiety cappuccino. Just as our brains can imagine the future, so too can they remember the past. Memory is one of nature's greatest gifts, but it comes at a cost. Because we can re-experience past events, we can be terrorized today by things that happened long ago. And that's what happens to people who suffer from PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder. You can't afford to have feelings when you're in a war. You kill or be killed. That's your main objective. Live and come home. After you see a war zone, yes, your mind gonna change. Warren King was a 19-year-old former high school football player when he joined the Marines and went to Vietnam he would return a different man. First couple of weeks when I came back home, it was kind of rough because that's when the dreams, the nightmares started, you know what I mean? But at first I laughed about it, you know, you know, you know, it's dreams, you know what I mean? But 
and start getting more deeper into me. Although Warren was in Vietnam for less than a year, he relived the war every day for the next three decades. I knew something was wrong, but I didn't pay no attention to it. So how did you know that you had PTSD? Well, at first, I didn't know I had PTSD. What did you think it was? Um, first I thought I was going crazy. You know, like I was losing my mind, you know. And then, eventually, I start remembering these dreams. And I start remembering where it took place. The people was in these dreams. And then, um, it started getting worse. I started doing, drinking more doing drugs, don't want to go to sleep. You know, eventually I was killing myself. For more than 30 years, Warren couldn't keep a job or even stand to be around other people. Eventually, he stopped leaving his house. I was possessed. My life ended. I didn't have nothing. Sometimes I didn't want to live but I was too scared to kill myself. Doctors at the Veterans Administration gave Warren a range of medications. Sleeping pills, antidepressants, anti-anxiety drugs. But nothing helped. Every night, the war in his head raged on. Although any kind of trauma can lead to PTSD, combat soldiers run an unusually high risk. Because traditional treatments fall short, tens of thousands of soldiers and their families are struggling with the disorder. Yeah, he did. He got a rope on that one. You got a little piece of that one, didn't you? Huh? Come on, sis. Just throw it. Bob is devoted to his wife and their two young children. But his mind keeps returning to something that happened in Iraq. Uniform stuff and flashlights are still dirty, see? And my letters all here from my wife. I got more stuff down in the bottom. I kept my uniforms and boots just for keepsakes. Smell that smell. Can't get it out. Can't get it out. In 2003, Bob crossed into Iraq as part of the first invasion forces. Within days, he found himself on the outskirts of Al Nazaria in one of the bloodiest battles of the conflict. The horrors of war were all around him, but one image in particular is burned into his memory, the face of the Iraqi soldier who died in Bob's arms. Our column was moving, and um, there was a bus, and it was, it was on fire. And there were people screaming and yelling. As we went by, you know, trying to assess quickly what was going on, and there were two guys laying there, and one of them was missing his leg, and the guy next to him had a big hole in his chest. So we knelt down and I just looked in the guy's face and I just looked at him, you know, I took my helmet off and I just looked at him and uh, he died looking at me. He literally breathed out his last breath and did his little rattle and stuff looking in my face and I watched his eyes go gray. And uh, right now as I tell you about that, I can see his face as clearly as if I'm looking at the floor, just that clearly. It's not some hazy memory. It's very clear, very clear. The voices, the words exchanged, the, the feeling, and, and, and that's the part I hate the most. I can feel what I felt as clearly as I felt it then. Nightly, he would wake up from a nightmare or he'd be talking to sleep, waking up. Uh, he'd be walking through the house on patrol. I didn't have that problem before. I mean, get, and anybody who sits up in their sleep and talks and stuff like that, that's, it is what it is. But not getting up and going on patrol or getting up and, you know, 
reliving a trauma scene again or getting up and shouting orders, you know, get me some cover fire over here. I got problems, this and that. <clears throat> That's not normal. Medication and psychotherapy haven't helped Bob much. And the tragedy in his past continues to wreak havoc in every aspect of his life. Three weeks ago, Bob lost his job as a news director of a TV station in Reno. We're moving. We're leaving Reno. And we're going back to the Bay Area to start over. Um, and do what, I don't know. I do think that the symptoms of PTSD that I deal with every day and the fact that I don't get a lot of rest because I can't sleep. So, yeah, it contributed to me losing my job here and my, probably my career. I worry about the stress of everything. I can't tell you how many times in the last couple months I've just like rolled over in the middle of the night just to make sure he's still breathing. Because <sighs> I just, I just don't know how much more he can handle. We didn't have a color tape for moms. <laughs> I'll tell you what's embarrassing to me is having to go back to my mother-in-law's house and regroup. I've never had to fall back like that before. It makes me feel like, you know, I've done all these things in my life and I, I just can't. How the hell did I, how did I get in this position? I feel like I failed and I let my family down. So what causes PTSD? Why do our brains sometimes remember the very things we'd most like them to forget? Emotional events leave long-lasting traces in memory. That's why we all know just where we were at 8.30 a.m. on September 11th, but not on September 10th. What gives these memories such staying power? When people experience intense emotions, their bodies release stress hormones, such as cortisol and adrenaline. And some scientists now believe that these hormones help burn in memories of the events that caused the emotions in the first place. For nearly a decade, Larry Cahill, a neurobiologist at the University of California, Irvine, has been studying the connection between stress hormones and memory. The experiment we're going to be running today, we're going to be looking at the physiological components of your emotions. To investigate the connection, Cahill and his colleagues designed an experiment in which two groups of students reported to their laboratory and watched a slideshow of disturbing images. After the slideshow, the students in one group were asked to hold their hands in a bucket of ice water for as long as they could, an experience that caused their bodies to release stress hormones. The students in a second group were asked to hold their hands in a bucket of lukewarm water with no release of stress hormones. Thanks for coming again, and uh, I should explain that we did mislead you a little bit last week. So last week we... A week later, we were the students returned to the laboratory and were surprised with a memory test. What we're actually going to do this week is I'm going to ask you to try and remember some of the images. The results were not what most scientists expected. Some of my colleagues, because they come from a slightly different perspective, they thought, well, you know, if you learn something new and then do something as, as distracting as dropping your arm in ice water, that should be really bad for memory. It should be really bad for the memory of what you just learned. You should forget it. Memory should be worse. And I can understand that, but that's not what we found. The results of Cahill's experiment showed that the students who had put their arms in ice water immediately after viewing the slideshow had much better recall of the images. The stress hormones coursing through their veins somehow burned the experience they were having into their memories. A good memory is exactly that, a balance between keeping what you ought to keep and getting rid of or abstracting what you can get rid of or abstract. What we think we have here with this whole business of stress hormones is a beautiful system built in for doing just that. Does the kind of research that you and others have done give us any insights into disorders like PTSD? When someone experiences something too traumatic, uh, a rape, a horrible car crash, uh, being in a battle, it could be that this normally very helpful memory boost system that we've been talking about 
somehow, and for reasons we don't fully understand, um, gets stuck in the on position, right? And in the period during and after the trauma, repeatedly strengthens a memory, strengthens a memory, strengthens a memory. The retrieval of the memory causes the stress hormones, and the stress hormones keep strengthening the memory, and you can imagine a positive feedback cycle. For Bob, moving to California to live with mother-in-law has left him demoralized. You guys gonna go outside and play? Okay. Lori and the kids are trying to adjust to a new routine and a new school, but Bob's PTSD holds each of them in its orbit. Welcome to California. Welcome yeah, back. Thank you. Welcome back. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so we're gonna today we're gonna talk about Gabriel and how he's doing in first grade, and he's only been here for a little bit of time, but he's transitioned well. So he's showing some good leadership skills uh, with his peers, with both the boys and the girls, and he seems to be happy. Uh, and if he needs help, he has no problem in asking me. Hey, try to okay. do it quietly, Sarah, please. Don't throw those, please. Okay. Sarah, can you make a happy face with that? Can you With the yellow? How about being quiet? That'd be something new. Oh, there's just so much to do. Okay, no more, no more dumping it in. Just okay. there you go. Thank Perfect. You. All right. Sarah. Okay. We'll clean those up later. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. I have 20 of them in here. I cannot stand loud. I can't. Noise sends my temper and my blood pressure up. And his writing, I'll show you a little bit of his writing. He, the hardest part about post-traumatic stress for a married woman is the focus is on him. But part of me feels like it's not okay for me to break down because the focus is on helping him and lifting him up and getting him through this time. He's so fragile right now. This time has to be about getting him through and getting him to a place where he feels like he's on solid ground again. Then I'll have my time. Oh, I love you, baby. PTSD threatens to destroy everything Bob cares about. As he looks for a new job in California, the obstacles seem almost insurmountable. I was mobilized twice, and I did uh, the invasion, and uh, we just moved back to California. We were gone out of state for 20 months, and we've been back about a month. Age limit. No matter what. No matter what. I'm too old. Only looking for officers, huh? Yeah, yeah. Some retail management, a lot of management in the news business. The market is running tough right now. Yeah. Because, yeah. Uh, I appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Thank you, sir. Before he left Reno, Bob learned about a new form of cognitive behavioral therapy to treat PTSD. But the treatment, a variation of the one used to treat phobias, would require Bob to confront the memories that haunt him. The counselor up in Reno made me promise him I would look into this program that they have. Um, but you know what, I'm just not there yet. I'm reading the paper and I see this University of Pennsylvania, PTSD, come to 3535 Market Street. So I said to myself, oh, here come another fluke. Here come another VA. You know what I mean? They're going to give me medications. But they didn't. At the University of Pennsylvania, researchers were developing a form of CBT called prolonged exposure therapy. Instead of hiding from his traumatic memories, this therapy would require Warren to embrace them, to relive them over and over again until his fear of them diminished. Reliving horror isn't easy.
Warren needed to face his memories both in and out of his therapist's office. The movie Full Metal Jacket had always sent Warren into a panic. Now, he forced himself to watch the movie again and again. Eventually, it began to get easier. We think that what's happening in exposure therapy is new learning. A lot of times people years ago used to think that in our work with anxiety that we were erasing a fear memory, and we know that that's not true. We're not erasing the memory. We're teaching the person new things. We're teaching them, for example, I don't need to be scared of this memory. Yes, this was a terrible thing that happened, but I don't need to be scared of it. I can go there, I can think about it, I can talk about it, and I'm okay. And that's new learning. After 18 sessions, Warren's progress is unmistakable. What I wanted to ask you to do today was to go through the story again. Um, to do the imaginal exposure. Um, and you remember how we do that. We have you talk about what happened from your memory. You know, close your eyes and really try to visualize it and put yourself back there, really try to revisit it. Close your eyes, visualize the memory, and start talking about it. We came in, we started taking machine gun fire. And everybody know that sound. When you hear that sound, you have to get down low as you can. You're afraid. And more and more you go on, you see people lying in with their guts out. There's nothing you can do for them. Then they're calling you by name. That's the worst part, but there's nothing you can do about it. You know, doctor, you just got to keep moving on. You just got to go there and do your job, you know what I mean? And it's, it's no time for guilt. Because he's always told, kill or be killed. That's the name of the game. <sighs> well, I'm okay. No sweating of the hands, no headache, a little teary, but as far as that, I'm all right. Okay. Let me ask you this. If I had PTSD, and I was haunted by dreams and haunted by thoughts, I'd want to get away from them. And the last thing I would do would go see a therapist who says, oh no, you're gonna, we're gonna talk about them. I'd say, oh no, I see enough of that at night. I don't want to see that during the day. Can you relate to people feeling that way? Well, I used to be like that. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to say nothing about it. But you gotta face it. Do you think there are a lot of soldiers who might not even ask for help because they have kind of this sense that I'm supposed to be brave, I'm supposed to make my way through this, I'm not supposed to ask other people to help me? Well, they're fools. They are fools. Because sometimes you need to drop that macho thing and ask for help because if you don't ask for help, you're going to die. And that's what you're going to be, macho man? Well, you know something? The graves are full of macho men. I've been doing this work for over 20 years now, and at times, the emotion in the room is just palpable, it's raw. I have felt like I was holding someone's broken heart in my hands, it's been so raw. But part of what I've taken away from this work is the resilience of the human spirit. It is just amazing what we can go through and how we can come through it at the other side and be okay. Would you say you're better now? Not just a little better, but all better? Well, I'm not gonna say I'm all better, but I know how to handle PTSD. You'd never get rid of PTSD. There's no cure for it. 